In the late afternoon of Thursday, October 27, 2005, in the Parisian suburb of clichy sous bois three teenagers of North African descent were coming home from a rugby game. They heard sirens and saw a police car, and since they were traveling without identity papers, they decided to disappear. Their hiding place, a power transformer, proved lethal. Two of the boys were killed by electrocution, and many of their neighbors blamed the police. A riot started in Clichy that very night. It spread to other Parisian banlieues, and eventually hundreds of cities experienced the fires. Molotov cocktails were hurled at buses, almost 10,000 private vehicles, and 30,000 trash cans were set ablaze. President Chirac declared a national state of emergency on November 8th, but the violence continued. On November 16th, the state of emergency was extended for another three months. But on the next day, it was largely over. The French police reported that the level of urban violence had returned to normal, with merely 98 vehicles burnt nationwide. Riots have been part of urban life for millennia. Supporters of Julius Caesar mobbed the homes of Cassius and Brutus, hoping to avenge the murder of the popular conqueror. In 1182, members of Constantinople's Eastern Orthodox majority charged into that city's Latin Quarter to exterminate Italian merchants who were both Roman Catholic and wealthy. English rioters repeatedly targeted Catholic targets, such as the Sardinian Embassy Chapel, which was attacked during the Gordon Riots of 1780. The chapel was in Lincoln's Inn Fields, and so was a Presbyterian meeting house, which had been mobbed during the Sacheverell riots. Religious divisions are often the stuff of rioting. Hindu-Muslim riots have made India one of the world's rioting centers. Americans have also had religious riots, such as the mob action that burned down an Ursuline convent near Boston in 1834. But in the secular 20th century, Americans have been more likely to riot for racial than for religious causes. Initially, race riots occurred when whites targeted African Americans who had allegedly violated some spurious rule. The Chicago race riot of 1919 started when an African American boy was stoned to death by white youths for swimming across an invisible Jim Crow line in Lake Michigan. Whites burned over 1,000 homes. During World War II, white soldiers attacked Latino youths who were wearing their zoot suits instead of serving in uniform. By the 1960s, race riots were instigated by African Americans themselves, some of whom were understandably angry after centuries of slavery and decades of discrimination. Watts burned in 1965, Detroit and Newark in 1967. Miami rioted in 1980, and over 50 people died in the Los Angeles riot of 1992. For 20 years, America had been relatively riot-free, except for the occasional student riot following a sporting event. But then in 2015, Baltimore rioted after the police shooting of Freddie Gray, an African-American youth. In 2016, police shootings led to riots in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Milwaukee. Ethnic fragmentation is strongly associated with rioting across countries. And the effects of racial division are particularly strong when different ethnicities are crowded together in cities. The economics of rioting focuses, unsurprisingly, on the costs and benefits of rioting to the individual rioter. Naturally, people are thought to riot when the benefits of rioting exceed the costs. Ed Banfield famously wrote an essay, Rioting for Fun and Profit, in which he argued that rioters just enjoy the mayhem. This is possible. My teenage self might have also liked burning up a trash can. More typically, analyses of rioting, like the Kerner Commission report of 1967, focus on the grievances of rioters. This view basically assumes that the desire to riot increases with unhappiness with the status quo, either because rioters are hoping that their actions will generate positive change, or because rioting is a form of vengeance taken against an unfair system. In the mid-1990s, I wrote a paper with Denise Di Pasquale examining the prevalence of race riots across U.S. cities during the 1960s. We found no correlation between rioting and either racial segregation or African-American poverty. Southern cities, where African-Americans were particularly poor and still suffered from discriminatory Jim Crow laws, had fewer, not more, riots. Across countries, dictatorship is associated with less, not more, rioting, which also supports the view that the degree of grievance doesn't determine the amount of rioting. While I have no doubt that many rioters were angry at real injustices, riots have been no more prevalent in places where injustice seems to have been larger. This either implies that the benefits of rioting aren't tied to the level of injustice, or that other factors matter more. The lower level of rioting and dictatorship 
for example, can be explained by brutal policing that suppresses rioting. The primary cost of rioting to the individual rioter is the probability of arrest, which becomes smaller as the riot becomes bigger. Consequently, rioting alone is pretty likely to land you in a jail cell. If you are one rioter among thousands, though, the police will typically miss you in the multitude. We found that a larger police force was typically associated with less damage from riots during the 1960s, even though police misbehavior was often cited as a reason for the riot. Because the costs of rioting fall with the number of rioters, riots are a classic tipping point phenomenon. One possibility is that no one riots. Another is that there is a huge amount of destruction. There are three standard ways in which a riot can reach sufficient scale to be self-sustaining. One possibility is organization. Gangs or political groups have coordinated violent action. But most of the time, riots are far more spontaneous than that. A second possibility is that a riot starts when a crowd has already gathered. The 1965 Watts riot began after a group had gathered to watch a drunk driving arrest. Riots often start at or after sporting events, where a crowd has already assembled to watch the game. Finally, and most interestingly, riots can occur when a belief has spread that a particular event will be a focal point, a particular event such as the acquittal of white police officers for the shooting or beating of an African American will start a riot. If enough people share this belief, then it will come true, and the event will spark a riot. Since the probability of arrest is so low when a riot is in full gear, there are few benefits from ramping up the punishments to rioting, which is what Prime Minister David Cameron tried to do during the English riots of 2011. This is a setting where the probability of punishment matters much more than the degree of punishment. Indeed, the usual path of a riot is that it doesn't stop until the level of police control is massively increased, say by bringing in the National Guard, which brings the probability of arrest back up again. The deadliest riot in U.S. history, the New York City draft riots, occurred in 1863. New York City's large immigrant populations didn't see why they were supposed to fight for the freedom of African Americans who might end up coming north and competing with them for jobs. When New York State started drafting its citizens, mobs started assaulting the draft equipment and then military and government offices. The initial crowds were somewhat more organized than in most riots, but the violence soon spun out of anyone's control. African Americans were particularly targeted. Germans turned on the Irish. More than 100 people died, and the physical destruction was enormous. The riot finally only ended when Union troops, who had been fighting at Gettysburg, reached New York and restored order. It is worth stressing that rioting has often been counterproductive. Riots can easily generate a majority backlash, and one can plausibly argue that the riots of 1967 led not to an expanded welfare state or less racism, but instead to the election of Richard Nixon. Riots often destroy the homes and businesses of other poor people. Cities enable people to coordinate. But sometimes the coordinated action is violent. Riots may have legitimate causes, but they also can do much harm, as illustrated by the African Americans killed in New York in 1863. Riots provide yet another example of why cities must tame the disorder that density can enable.